to check. Yes, I think it has started. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Yes, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for being here. It has been amazing. Like I was getting like all of these texts from my friends and my colleagues and everyone is like, you know, like he replied to you and he wanted to be in the show. How does it feel? How does it feel? And I was like, <laughs> it, it felt crazy. <laughs> no, very, very happy to be here. So th thanks for the invitation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We can wait for a couple more minutes for people to join in and then we can start maybe after five minutes if it's fine for you. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Whereabouts in uh, Finland are you based at the moment? Uh, I'm in... Yeah, just outside Helsinki, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your audio is um, uh, up and down, so um, it was it was fine, and then it faded away. So I don't know what the difference was. But now is it better? You're very soft in the background, so um, I have no idea. Maybe there's like a loose connection or something. Yeah, that was better. Okay. Yeah, now that's can you hear me? Now I can hear okay. you just fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can wait for a couple more minutes. So, how how is the weather there? Where in which location are you right now exactly? I'm I'm in Belgium. So um, uh, that's uh, I was born in Belgium, um, but uh, I've traveled the world. But I, I live in Belgium again now, and Belgium is is quite moderate weather. I mean, it's never too cold, it's never too warm. Um, although it seems to be getting warmer, um, you know, in the last couple of years, but uh, it's it's a very moderate climate. Okay, but uh, like today it's like raining over here, and I think like everyone is like super not happy about this. Well, it's I in guess... the summer, you know, like expecting the sun all the time, and then with, when it rains, everyone is just like, oh my god. That's true. We we actually live on an old farm, and uh, we're surrounded by farmers, and they're very appreciative of the rain. I mean, for them, it's uh, it's actually a good thing when it rains. So yeah, <laughs> of course, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's not for everyone, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's how th how I think like life is. Like you know, one thing is good for one people, and then the other thing is not. And no, that's absolutely. How it goes. But um, yeah, I think that's the pros and cons of pretty much everything there is out there. So you know, it's the it's the universe balancing out, I guess. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. How is has everything like opened in Belgium? How is the whole situation there? So Belgium is now in the, in the final stages of of lock uh, of exit. Um, so everything is pretty much back to normal. Uh, the only difference, of course, is that uh, live events um, are still limited. So um, it means no concerts. Um, you know, the movie theaters just opened up, um, but with a lot of precautions in terms of social distancing. But um, you know we're not allowed to have, for example, the music festivals, you know, which is typically a summer activity. That's that's still not allowed. Uh, but for most part, I mean, um, you know, the, the the normal activity has resumed. The traffic jams have uh, resumed, unfortunately. Um, but what we do see is that the the traffic to the food retailers was very intense during lockdown and remains intense. But for example, the traditional uh, clothing retailers don't see the same type of traffic. Um, so there is something there that people are still probably hesitant to actually you know, try or you know, just you know, shop in a normal fashion. So, um, but most of the measures now have been lifted, especially for, uh, except for you know, really, really big mass events. So we had a big summer festival which was called Tomorrowland. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like one of the biggest dance festivals in the world, where people really travel from all over the globe to go there. Um, it's it's wonderfully themed. It's not just music. It's it's just 
the whole entourage. It's like you're in Disneyland with house, with you know, with 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 music, um, and that's something which is very unfortunate. We can't actually have those activities, but um, we're in the final stages of exit. That's basically where we are. Yeah, this, in Finland, it is kind of the same. Everything has started opening up, and. Uh... Yeah, it's going good. I think this whole situation is getting better on this side of the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we can already start and then. So if you would like to introduce yourself, I know a lot of people already know about you, but for the few people who doesn't know about you, would you like <laughs> to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. So my name is uh, Peter Hinson. Um, I'm European. Um, I live in Belgium. I'm an engineer, um, as you can see from you know the 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 stuff that I collect behind me. I'm a I'm a pretty avid collector of old vintage computing, uh, which means that I've been around for a long time. I remember the very first Macintosh when it came out in 1984, um, and I never stopped collecting. I'm I'm one of the largest Apple collectors in uh, in Europe, I think. Uh, but I'm an engineer at heart. I still um, love electronics and I love programming. For 15 years, um, startups was my life. After graduating, I did uh, three technology startups. One was a company that we, uh, we sold to Alcatel, the French telecoms company. Uh, the second was a streaming video company, which we sold to Vodafone. And the third was a cloud company that we put on the stock exchange. We IPO'd in 2006. And then uh, we sold it to our Canadian competitors four years later. But 15 intense years of startup life, which I loved very, very much. And then in 2010, I made a huge shift in my life. I, I said I want to do other things. Um, I started teaching at London Business School and then uh, later at MIT. Um, and I started to investigate how large companies actually did innovation. I, I already knew very well how startups innovated because I did that for 15 years. But then I was really curious about how traditional companies would actually innovate. And that's been the last 10 years of my life. Um, I wrote a few books on it. One is called Digital is the New Normal, which uh, took off you know, 10 years ago. Um, I've written a book called The Network Always Wins on Network Effects. I've written a book, The Day After Tomorrow, How to Look Ahead. And I just finished a new book called The Phoenix and the Unicorn, uh, which is about reinvention of traditional companies. So, you know, in a nutshell, I'm a nerd. Um, but, you know, first I focused on the startups and now I focus on the large traditional companies. Yeah, one of the most famous nerds that that's what I have to say. <laughs> well, thank you for the honor, but I wear the the the, the nerd badge with pride. I think, uh, yeah, I, I have a seventeen year old son, and uh, yeah, we have a, a lab here um, filled with oscilloscopes, and you know, just I, I love to tinker with all this stuff. This is this is my uh, this is my natural habitat, and I think making things has never been so wonderful, and and that is still very much part of my core. Mm -hmm. Is he is he also interested in the stuff that you're interested in, or he is he more into the business background or like arts background? How do, how does it go? No, my uh, our son is 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 really into technology. So um, we we bought an old church last year uh, close to where we live, which is now housing my Apple collection, and it was wonderful to actually do that together with him. I mean. To see uh, you know, a 50 year old man and a 17 year old boy getting very excited about you know getting 40 year old electronics to work again was a wonderful thing. So you know we're we're both nerds. I think it runs in the family. <laughs> that is amazing. Would you also mind telling us a bit about your book, The Phoenix and the Unicorn, and like what people can take away from reading that book? No, would love to. So I, I started writing the the Phoenix and the Unicorn because. Yeah, we spent 10 years <clears throat> at large talking about the new companies, the unicorns, and how they were changing the world. And I think we, we got a lot of inspiration from that. I mean, uh, it was wonderful to read about Google and Uber and Airbnb and all those wonderful companies. 
But when I was giving lectures, what I saw is that a lot of traditional companies said, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful, but we're not Google. I mean, we're not Uber. We're not a unicorn. And what can we learn on how to maybe adapt? And that gave me the inspiration for the Phoenix and the unicorn. How can companies uh, maybe borrow a few um, tricks from the playbook of the unicorns and reinvent themselves? And that's basically the basic um, premise of the book. Um, I inspired myself on a number of companies which I admire, which have done exactly that. They have done a phoenix. I mean, they have reinvented themselves. And probably uh, the most important company was Walmart. Uh, I had a chance to be very close to Walmart in the last two years. Walmart is the largest traditional retailer on the planet. I mean, uh, they're not uh, very active in Europe, but in the U.S., um, they have more than 5,000 stores. And to give you an idea, Walmart is the, the number one company in the Fortune 500, their Fortune 1. Um, they employ worldwide 2.5 million people. I mean, it's the largest employer in the world. I think there's only one organization bigger than Walmart, and that's the Chinese army, but that's not a, a normal commercial operation. Uh, and what I find really fascinating is that uh, many people thought Walmart would never you know, survive in the 21st century because they would be eaten alive by Amazon. Amazon is the unicorn. But when I saw Walmart yeah. reinventing itself and becoming a true phoenix, I got really inspired. And I've put a lot of examples into that book. So it's really a book for uh, the, the non-unicorns. It's a book for traditional companies who want to understand innovation, who want to reinvent themselves, come out stronger. And that's the whole idea of the Phoenix. Even when things go really, really rough, um, you can grab yourself together, reinvent what you do, and actually come out stronger. That's the, the whole concept of the Phoenix and the unicorn. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say like all of this innovation that we we talk about, would you say that is it innate in people or can people learn to have that mindset and that characteristic in themselves? It's a really good question. And um, I think the, the there are many things that you can learn. That I'm absolutely certain of that. But I think maybe more important than that is an absolute willingness to actually do it. And that is something where you, you don't actually see that um, in every company. I mean, every time there is a challenge or an adversity, you, you either you, you fight, you, you flee, you try to run away, or you freeze. And uh, look at the last crisis. I mean, it was a good example of that. I mean, we couldn't run away, of course, but we could hide. Uh, but many companies froze. I mean, they were, oh, my God, we have no idea what's happening. And how do we deal with this? And, um, but I think the mentality to address it and to fight it, I think that might be the most important characteristic. And this is either you have it or you don't. So um, I think there's a lot of things that you can learn, there are a lot of techniques, but in the book, there's, there's five things that I find really important. One is what I call a sense of urgency. And I've seen that if companies really don't have a sense of urgency of the need to change, they're probably not going to make it. That goes very much to that, that attitude. Um, the second is you need to combine the old and the new. You need a, a very clear vision on how to get it across. And um, this is not a given either because you, you really have to figure out how can you leverage what you did well in the past and at the same time do the new. You have to combine the old and the new. Then you need to get everybody in the same uh, mindset then you need to get everybody in the same shared direction. And then you need to enable the innovators in the organization. And I think it's a combination of those five factors which make it very important to actually you know, get the possibility of a phoenix actually happening. But it starts with the number one, a sense of urgency, not to alarm people or not to scare people, but to have the, the, the willingness to fight and to do something about it. And um, you know, the worst is if you come from a position where you're very comfortable, uh, there is always this idea, why would you change? Yeah? Why would you innovate? I mean, we're still making money. 
And I think the, the best example is you know, companies who are capable of reinventing themselves before they run into trouble. And that is what I call the rarest of beasts. But if you can do that, um, I think you avoid a lot of difficulties. Um, but it's almost unnatural. If you're doing well, you think, you know what, I'll just keep on doing what I've always been doing because it's fine. But in a world that is moving so fast, it doesn't work. We have to actually even start thinking about reinvention, even when we're doing very well. And I think that is the number one priority. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I was also going to ask you, like, do you think like innovation or die is a good term to use here? Because like, if you're not running through innovation and going with the fast pace changing world, then would you survive in the long run? Well, I think we, we we are in a world that is, in my opinion, going faster. Now, not everybody agrees on that because some people say, well, you know, my grandparents, they lived in a world where there was no electricity and, and they put a man on the moon. And, and, you know, I mean, what are we excited about, about a platform to share cat pictures? Is, is that really the big progress? Um, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I think we see so many technologies now coming together and I think it's the combination which is really accelerating. And I think this is something that I find extremely interesting to, uh, to, to look at because um, I think we've seen in the last 10 years that in many, many markets, the outside world started to change. I mean, the way that we had to deal with consumers, the way that consumers would find information, the way that consumers would buy things, the outside world started to heat up and accelerate. And you saw that those companies who, who didn't actually have the capability internally to match the speed of the outside were just incapable of addressing the opportunities. So it's probably not about dying as much as being able to capture um, the possibilities, capture the opportunities. And I think this is probably the most important thing. How can you actually reap the benefits as an organization, as a company, if you do actually address um, those those opportunities. So, you know, it, it's, it's probably not a question of dying. Although, let's be honest, I mean, history book is filled with companies that didn't make it. I mean, look at Kodak. I mean, it's the, the obvious example that everybody uses over and over again. But, you know, there are a million Kodaks out there which, you know, didn't innovate and don't exist anymore. But I think in this world, I'd like to phrase it less as dying, but more as capturing opportunities, because I think there has never been more opportunities to rethink um, how we can innovate and how we can accelerate. Mm -hmm. Also, in your book, as I've already read it, and it's amazing, I would suggest everyone to Thank read you. it and to buy it. And I'd want to know like uh, the four innovations that you talked about. Would you mind telling our audience about the four innovations. Sure. So in, in the book, what I do is I, I try to give a framework on the four types of, of, of innovation patterns that we see. And it, it's product, it's market, it's service, and it's business model. And when you look at products, um, this is about, I think, the traditional way of looking at innovation. I mean, it's BMW introducing a new model. Uh, it's Apple introducing a new product. And this is a well-established pattern, I think, of, of how companies think about innovation. But I think that's only part of it. When you look at market innovation, where you go and address entirely new markets, where you get out of the comfort zone as a company and look at new customer opportunities or you know, new ways of expanding, uh, but you're entering territory which you don't know. And I get very excited about market innovation. I think we now see that the um, advent of new technologies allows companies to actually address new markets that they couldn't address before. On the other side is what I call service innovation. It's, it's using technology to improve the service uh, towards customers. Um, and often that is a more iterative approach. I mean, you're constantly tweaking and fine tuning and, and trying to get a better service level of detail to your customers. And eventually, if you look at the big one, 
it's where all of a sudden your business model changes. And that could be as a result of technology or you know, some innovation, could be market rules that change, it could be consumer behavior, but all of a sudden the way you made money changes, your business model changes. And what I found is that if you look at product market service and business models, there are very unique patterns that apply. Um, a lot of good and bad things, a lot of examples of things that went you know, wonderfully you know, well, but also things that went horribly, horribly wrong. And I think it's really interesting for a company to actually look at what kind of a canvas do we need? And what I fundamentally believe that in this day and age, which is heating up, which is going faster, in this you know, VUCA world, as everybody keeps calling it, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, we actually need to fire on all cylinders. I think companies probably need to do all four. They need to think about product and market and service and business model innovation. And that's the type of canvas that uh, I tried to address in the book. Mm -hmm. Would you also mind going more deeper into each type and then talking about a good example and bad example of the four types of innovation, product, oh. market, service, and model? How many hours do you have? Uh, but uh, no, uh, I, I love that. I mean, I, I mean, when I, when I was the question, I was thinking the same, like it would take up so much time. <laughs> well, I mean, um, and, and it's the wonderful thing is it's something that is uh, happening every single day because you know, there is so much creativity being unleashed onto the world that, that we can be witness of that I, I find it fascinating. And, and I always try to put it into those buckets because I try to say, okay, is this more product or market or business model? But let me start with product. I think this is what we're most familiar with. Um, and, and, and I like your, your spin, good or bad, because um, it's often that we look at the, the great innovations and we say, oh, wow, you know, I mean, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the iPad was a wonderful you know, product innovation. Yeah? True. But I think for every good product innovation, there must be thousands of really bad product innovations. And it's easy to see the incremental problems. Um, but, but let me give you an example. I mean, um, uh, if you look at a product failure um, or a product innovation that went bad that we know quite recently, it's Google Glass. So, I mean, um, if you remember the hype around augmented reality and, and virtual reality, and especially the potential of using glasses to you know, have a completely extra dimension onto the world, everybody loved the idea of Google Glass. But when it came out, it was an absolute disaster. I mean, um, yeah, the battery didn't last very long. Um, what you had as extra information in your eye field was actually very, very limited. The quality and resolution wasn't very good. And the most horrible thing, if you put it on for an hour, one ear would be, you know, four de centigrees, uh, degrees warmer than the other ear. So this was not a good thing to actually wear. But the idea was there. And I think this is what you see often is that you actually sometimes need to you know, uh, wait for the market to ripe or, you know, wait for the technology to mature. So Google Glass for me is a great example of a bad product innovation. Um, look at Kodak. They had um, a digital camera, um, which was uh, a really bad product innovation because it still required some sort of a, a film to actually record the digital images. And that was because, you know, their whole business model was based on selling film. Now, if you look at good yeah. product innovations, I mean, Apple is a wonderful example because they have both. They have both good and bad. I think we can all agree that the iPhone was a, a really good innovation and the iPod was a great innovation. But if you look at it, 20 years before the iPad, they introduced the Apple Newton, which was a handheld personal digital device that was like the precursor to the iPad and it was just too early. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a great idea, but the technology wasn't mature, and therefore the product actually failed in the market. My favorite part in the product section is where you actually have two mm -hmm. competing products, and um, it's a long time ago now. But um, if you look at when e-readers came out, you had the Sony e-reader and you had the Kindle, and actually the Sony was probably a better product. I mean, superior technology, 
but it was the Kindle who actually became the new normal for the very simple reason is that Amazon was so good at actually marketing their product. So that's the, the product uh, section. If you look at the, 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 the market innovation, um, my favorite example, and it's in the book as well, is that there is a guy in Sweden who has a, a museum of failures. Um, and th this is a wonderful, wonderful individual who actually collects um, innovations that just go horribly, horribly wrong. And one of my favorites in his museum is uh, Colgate, which we all know from you know brushing our teeth because Colgate is synonymous with toothpaste. What happened is um, about 20 years ago, Colgate said, well, you know, it's always the toothpaste. I mean, we have every flavor of toothpaste. Um, we have everything from whitening to, you know, raspberry. We have everything. Let's go for an entirely new market. And what market did they go for? Lasagna. I mean, they actually introduced a series of frozen TV dinners with the Colgate brand. So you could buy Colgate lasagna to put in your microwave. Now, this was crazy when you think about it. And Colgate is now pretty much ashamed of it. But I love the fact that you know, this Swedish guy in the Museum of Failure actually has a mock-up of the Colgate lasagna brand. I mean, that's a clear idea. And you can think, what were they thinking to go into lasagna? I mean, who would ever want to eat something like that? Now, um, if you look at a good product, uh, a good market innovation, probably my favorite one at this moment is what Amazon is doing. Because if you look at um, uh, Amazon, yes, it's in Stockholm. Um, if you, um, I see a user asking, is it the Museum of Failure located in Stockholm? Yes. Yeah. Um, but what is fascinating is that um, Amazon, well, it was a retailer, uh, an online retailer, uh, but it was really a technology platform. And when they introduced AWS, so Amazon Web Services, which is basically giving other people access to the Amazon technology, that's what they did. Uh, people said, that's the, the dumbest idea. When it came out, Amazon Web Services, Business Week said uh, there was a cover saying Jeff Bezos should just mind the store and not get into technology. But what we now see 10 years later, Amazon is one of the biggest tech players in the world. They have gone from being a retailer to being a technology giant. So I find it fascinating that when Amazon Web Services introduced a new market, people said lasagna. And now it's probably one of the most profitable engines that is driving the growth of, of uh, Amazon. So I always tell people, product innovation, those are established patterns. But when you look at market innovation, you really have to figure out what is your lasagna radar? What is your capability to look beyond just what you see right in front of you? Now, in the, the other two, when you look at service innovation, it's constantly improving things. Um, probably one of my favorites um, was when McDonald's introduced the kiosks in uh, restaurants and, and airports. And in the beginning, people said, why? I mean, I could just go up to the counter and just order my Big Mac. Why would I need to punch in in a kiosk? But if you've ever been in a McDonald's with small kids and one doesn't like onions, one doesn't like pickles, one doesn't like mustard, I mean, thank God you can get the order right. I've been in McDonald's in maybe 100 countries in the world. And, you know, when you have to address somebody and you don't speak their language and, you know, I, I, I don't like cheese, then I'm really glad that I can do it in whatever language. And it turns out this is a very minute service innovation. But look at now with Corona, we see all the restaurants doing it because it's the only way to actually have a safe way to get your order. And I think those are interesting things, little things that you appreciate as a user and say, ah, that's great. I, I take uh, Google as an example. They're constantly doing service innovation. Um, I, we don't even think about it sometimes, but they're constantly changing how we interact with them. A few years ago, Google introduced autocomplete, where you, know, you start typing and it just finishes your question for you. And that's a very little thing in that helps the customer so much. Sometimes there is bad service innovation as well. You're probably too young to remember this, but 
in one of the previous versions of Windows, there was uh, a very annoying character, which was a little paperclip that when Windows saw that you were having a problem or you were in Microsoft Word and you, you were clearly you know, not finding what you needed to find, it was a little paperclip that would jump up called Clippy and it would be the most annoying character ever. And of course, Microsoft wanted to improve the customer experience, but people started to hate Clippy the paperclip. So even service innovation can be bad or backfire. The last one is, is model innovation. And I think this is where um, when your business model changes or you feel that the need is there to change your business model, um, I think it's the most difficult one to get right. But if you do it, I mean, look at the cloud business. Amazon started the cloud business, but all of a sudden, uh, Microsoft had to reinvent itself. And today, in, in about five years' time, Microsoft is actually now very much a cloud company. I mean, everything happens in the cloud. But if your traditional business is selling licenses, and all of a sudden, you have to change your business model to think about a cloud revenue. I think that is something which is absolutely different. And I think that's the most difficult one to actually do. Uh, a great example of um, you know, what is possible is you know, what is now happening with Disney. I think Disney is a great example of company uh, that is also doing firing all cylinders. But look at what they launch with Disney+. Plus. I mean, they, they had to fight Netflix, but to go to Disney Plus, which is basically Disney as a service, is a great example of business model innovation. And during Corona, we've seen that their growth was absolutely spectacular. So that's a really good example. But there are bad examples of business model innovation as well. One of the, the, the challenging um, sectors at this moment is mobility. If you are a car company, and you have to reinvent yourself, that is not an easy thing. And we probably know that you know we're going to have to, uh, if you're a car company, the future probably isn't selling cars. The future is maybe mobility as a service. But that proved to be a very difficult thing to do. I mean, BMW had this thing called Drive Now, um, but they're scaling back because they can't make it work. Um, we've all seen the pictures of, for example, the e-bikes the e in China, you know, trying to do mobility as a service in China, but with piles of you know, rusty e-bikes just piling up in the streets because the model just doesn't work. So it's a constant reinvention. So I think what you see is that for every uh, you know, good product market service or business model innovation, there's probably a thousand bad ones. But I, I like to focus on the good ones because I think we can get more inspiration from, from the good examples than to have a lot of you know, historical anecdotes of people who got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Before we go, before I go to the next question, I'd also like to tell to the audience, like if you have any questions, you can put in the comments and then Peter will answer them through the couple of more minutes that we have. So would you say, like, how would you suggest different companies to innovate or, like, what steps they would have to follow? Now, of course, this is a very broad question, and it will also take a lot of time, but I was thinking, like, how, what steps do you go? Like, how do you think about it? Well, I, I think one of the concepts that I introduced in the book uh, is called the hourglass model, and I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. And I, I got the idea actually from um, a company that I worked with, uh, a customer, uh, and a company that I, I really love. And the company is called Medtronic. Now, you, I don't know if you know the company or not, but they are one of the largest uh, makers of medical devices in the world. The company is actually a great story because um, it's, they are the largest pacemaker company in the world. Now, I hope you don't have a pacemaker, but you know, millions of people um, their lives were saved by a very simple device um, that actually helps uh, monitor and, and regulate your heartbeat. Um, the founder of Medtronic, it's a really interesting story. Um, he actually was um, somebody who worked in a hospital um, as, an, as an electrician um, back in the 1950s. 
And in those days, if you had a heart condition, you had to go into the hospital and they would use electric pulses to stimulate your heart. But these were big, big machines that were hooked up to the power source in the hospital. And the founder of Medtronic was somebody who worked in the hospital and he was in Minneapolis working in a hospital when there was a thunderstorm and they lost power for hours and these patients would die. And he figured out how he could hook up a car battery to actually make a portable version to stimulate the heart. He thought, wow, I'm onto something. Long story short, this is now a $30 billion company that is the largest maker of pacemakers in the world. And they do a lot of medical devices. But I was fascinated by them because uh, Medtronic said, well, we're, we're king of the hill in terms of pacemakers, but nobody stays in their lane. Everything is non-linear. And um, if you look at it, you know, there are uh, at this moment, look at Apple with the Apple Watch. They're measuring all your heartbeats. They're monitoring your EKGs. Maybe that could be somebody who eats our lunch if we're not careful. So they said, what we need to do is to have a wider lens on all the possible innovations. And they told me about this thing called the hourglass. Now, we know what the shape of an hourglass is like. There's the top part and there's the bottom part. And the top part, this is your wide lens to look at the future. Deep range sensors, picking up ideas and innovations, figuring out how to actually be able to capture ideas. And then there is the part where you experiment, you try things, and you need to narrow down the potential innovations and say, yeah, that's what we do. And then it drops into the bottom part of the hourglass. And this is the Swiss clockwork where you run and scale and focus on the bottom line. And the big question is, the top part clearly is innovation. The bottom part is running it in you know, a very efficient way. But what is the percentage of activity and resources and people that you have in the top and in the bottom part? And Medtronic realized that um, a few years ago, they had less than 3% of all their activities in the top part and 97% in the machine to make money. And they realized in a world that was moving fast, they needed to really change that. They're now in a situation where they're going, and I see this with many companies, where they say maybe it, it, should, it shouldn't be three, it should be 30% of our activity to have that wide lens and to focus on innovation. Now, there are two elements there. How much effort, resources do you spend between the top and the bottom part? But the second part is even more important, is how do you align these two? Because I've seen so many companies who have brilliant ideas and they do all the experimentation, but then it falls flat. It doesn't get picked up by the machine. So you need to align the top and the bottom part so that there is a logical flow of innovation. And I think that might be the most important thing. I mean, I've seen too many companies with brilliant ideas, but the innovators don't get supported. And the result is that they actually don't achieve their maximum potential for reinvention and becoming a phoenix. And I think that's where I really like that model of the hourglass because you know, maybe we need a different culture in the top than in the bottom, maybe different leadership, maybe different skills or resources. But I find that when I talk to companies and you try to map how much do they do in the top and the bottom part, they start to think about maybe there are other ways to do this in a more efficient way. And that's why I really like that model of the hourglass. And I put it full front and center into the phoenix and the unicorn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty amazing way to think and look into this whole innovation that how, how would you go about it? Because if it is only ideas and it never comes into action, then... Like there might be an Amaz like a CEO of Amazon who is like sitting right now and not executing on his ideas. And that is why we don't know him. Absolutely. And, and I remember a quote, um, I, I talked about Microsoft. I think Microsoft has done a, a tremendous transformation in the last couple of years. But um, I think before Satya Nadella came on board, they were not doing very well. I mean, Microsoft was in trouble at that time. And I remember it was a Google executive. It might have been Eric Schmidt, the, the, the chairman at the time, who said, there's probably seven Googles inside of Microsoft's mm -hmm. R&D department, but they're just not getting out anymore. And I think that is the scary part. If you have the innovation potential, but you don't have the mechanisms to unlock that, that's actually 
um, a pretty sad situation. Mm -hmm. And about this book, I mean, we have been talking about all of these things, and I think that a lot of people would be interested. Would you mind telling us? Can we find the audio book and also the and buy the book from the? I will give the sources here, but can you also mention like, can we get the audio book and? Oh yes, absolutely. It was it was really fun because uh, this is my uh, fourth book that I've I've published, um, and the previous one. Um, uh, was published with McGraw Hill, and all of a sudden I, I get a, a CD, and it was the audio version of the book, and uh, it was really strange to hear um, somebody else, you know, speaking my my language, and I said I don't want to do it this time. Um, I want the audio version, but I want you know to do it myself. Um, so in January I I spent. I think three or four days in the studio locked up to make the full audio version of the book. And it was really fun because I'd be in a studio and there'd be a sound engineer on the other side of the glass. And, um, I, but yeah, he was a nerdy guy as well. And uh, I started you know, getting into reading the book and all of a sudden he, he would first correct me and say, well, you know, you, you had a little thing there and let's do that again. And you know, that sound wasn't very clear. So let's repeat that. And after a while, he interrupted me and said, "Yes, yes. And do you know about this example? And you know, what about that?" And I said, "Yeah, that that that's further into the book." So he was getting really excited. You know, it was fun to do that with the audio guys. So there's a full, um, of course, yeah. You, there's a physical book, there's an ebook, and there's an audio book. But I think it's it's almost ten hours of audio. So if you have a really long drive, huh, uh, or you know, you have the opportunity to uh, to really take it in. Uh, be prepared. It's a 10-hour audio version of The Phoenix and the Unicorn. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's it's super amazing. And I, would, I, I think that that is also people who are going too much into their listening to these audio books. And that is why I think podcasts are also rising so much. Because yeah. people, they, they don't, I mean, they want to do everything on their own time and not like on people's time. So then they could like save it and then they could just hear and do something else. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I, if you, no, if you don't mind, if, after the post-production, if uh, anyone has any questions, I would forward those to Katie and then she can send it to you. Absolutely. More than happy to follow up with uh, any remarks or questions that people would have. Yeah, because I think like I, I hope that there will be some company specific questions to like ask you like, hey, how do we innovate? We do this, we do that. How do we innovate? I think absolutely. But I think what is important is that um, this is uh, this is a time where I, I think we, we had this idea of lessons learned. And I think that was the mentality of the past. What I like to talk about now is what I call lessons learning. I think companies are going to have to figure out how to do it as we go along. Mm -hmm. Because I think the idea of, oh, we'll just wait for the Harvard Business Review uh, article and follow the five steps and we'll be fine. Those days are over. This is about trying, experimenting, even in our innovation approaches. And that's why I like lessons learning more than lessons learned. Because I think that's the mentality that companies need to have. Thank you so much, Peter, for being here. I know how much busy you are, and I'm really grateful that you like accepted to be a part of this show. I'm pretty sure it would be, I mean, it has been amazing for me, and I'm pretty sure it will be amazing for our community. And thank you so much for this. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Good luck with the show, and uh, love to follow up and uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is great. Thank you. Have a great day. And of course, like I'm going to use this like I had Peter in my show and then like get the next speakers <laughs> from there. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.